Something important in cosmology is called Hubble's Law. This is named after a scientist named Edwin Hubble. Um, he was around from 1889 until I think it was 1953 when he died. But um, he's a very famous astrophysicist. And in fact, um, there's a famous telescope that's orbiting around the Earth called the Hubble Space Telescope. It's kind of cool because, you know, if, if this right here is the Earth, for example, so there's the Earth. Um, if we're trying to actually take pictures of stars you know, that are out around us and you know, we want to take pictures of these nice stars or these galaxies well the problem is that we have an atmosphere well I suppose it's not a problem it's something we like so the very fact I mean we have this very thin sort of atmosphere around us now obviously I'm drawing it much much bigger than it actually is but imagine this little layer here of oxygen and nitrogen and stuff that we breathe and keeps us happy but this stuff right here acts um, to twinkle the stars in other words, when we take a look at the light from a star, it's all messed up. What that means is even if we have a really good telescope that we're using on the ground in order to look at stars, the stars are going to be fuzzy. And so what you can do, well, there's two ways to do it. Uh, one thing you can do to untwinkle the stars is to take your telescope and put it up in orbit. So what if you have your telescope sort of sitting up in space? And that's actually what they did with what's called the Hubble Space Telescope. So imagine this thing has little solar panels here, and it's a little thing right here, and it sort of it looks out into the stars. So this thing then orbits around the Earth. And this te space telescope is called the Hubble Space Telescope, named after this guy. But by the way, another way you can untwinkle the stars is really cool. It's something fairly recent. Um, people figured out that you can actually untwinkle the stars in a sense by using what's called adaptive optics and that's something I could probably do a video on later on it's really interesting field I think where what they can do is they shine a laser uh, beam from the ground it goes up into the sky a little bit and it uh, excites some sodium atoms for example high in the atmosphere those give off light then they take that light they sample it they look at how that light has been sort of distorted and from there they refix the mirror and basically adjust the way the mirror is in order to untwinkle the stars now, of course, the atmosphere is doing this every second. It's distorting them differently. So this is sort of a constant little system. But I suppose the simplest way but most expensive way is just to build a satellite, you know, put your telescope up in space. Then there's nothing to worry about, uh, except for huge, huge costs, of course. Now, this Hubble's Law, this is obviously named after him. Uh, he figured out that, uh, well, he's not the only one who figured it out, but he's the one who sort of, made it famous, um, he found out that the recession speed of galaxies, so the recession speed and the distance, those are related. So this is kind of a key thing here. So what that means is if we did a graph, let's say I did a graph of distance so this could be, now instead of making it in kilometers or even meters, we're going to call them, uh, we're going to do it in mega parsecs. In other words, millions of parsec. Remember one parsec, remember, is 3.26 light years. So we're talking about things in the millions of light years, right? Because a million parsecs, well, that's just 3 million light years. So that's the distance in parsecs. And here we're going to have the recession speed. And that'll be in kilometers per second. And if we do that, he found out, or at least he estimated, that it was a roughly linear curve. So this is sort of how it went. So that means the faster something is going, the farther it is. So if something is this far away, let's say, what you could do, oh, sorry, if something has a recession speed of, let's say, this value right here, then you can say, ah, that means it's this far away or vice versa. If you see something this far away, you can estimate it's that fast. That's how fast it's going. So that has to do with the size of the universe. Now what we can do, of course, this is a straight line, and it's a straight line through the origin. And remember, when you have a straight line through the origin, in other words, through zero, zero, what we can say then is this, uh, if we call this here V, and we call this D, now we can say that V is proportional to D. It's directly proportional. 
In fact, we can write down something for it. We can go even further. We can say v then equals some number, some sort of slope here, times d. In fact, we're going to call it h0. This is the sort of equation we use here for this. So this is like your, that's like your y. This right here is like your x. This right here is your gradient. You know, if you remember how graphs go of a straight line, it goes y equals mx plus b. You know, y equals the gradient times x plus the y-intercept. Well, the y-intercept is 0 because it passes through 0, 0. So that's why this term sort of disappears. So we get just, you know, y equals mx. So in this case, the y is actually v, and the x is d. And this constant, it's actually called Hubble's constant. Big surprise. Okay, so this h0, that's what that is. So maybe we'll define that. So h0 equals Hubble's constant. And it's just the gradient of this graph. So this one right here, we'll say the gradient of this graph right here, that just equals Hubble's constant. So that's really nice. And in fact, um, a lot of astronomers are spending their entire careers trying to figure out what H0 is. Because it all depends on what kind of sort of cosmology rules you're using, and that gives you different values of H0. But it turns out knowing what H0 does tells us an immense amount about the universe, about what it's going to do, what it has done in the past, and a lot about our laws of physics and how things work. So we can take a look, for example, at one of these. This is some real data here. So this is a Hubble diagram, as it's often called. That's that same graph. This is v versus d. See, we've got here, we've got v, and this is the distance. And it's in megaparsecs. This is in kilometers per second. Now, they did this for really distant objects. These are actually called type 1a supernovas. And this is actually uh, fairly recent stuff. When they've actually figured this out, we were talking about this in previous videos. We talk about a standard candle. The very fact that you see a supernova of this type, it's called 1A. You can tell that from its uh, chemical composition, which you can see from its spectrum. It turns out if you see this certain spectral lines that tells you it's a type 1A supernova, we know that type 1A supernovas, if this is time, and this right here is the uh, apparent brightness, we know that they all basically do something like this. You know, the sort of brightness goes up and then it sort of goes down. And it turns out, it's thought that all type 1a supernovas have roughly the same maximum intensity. And that tells us then that if we see one that's lower, that tells us then that it's farther away. You know, because if we appear to see it, the apparent brightness is less, then we know it's because it's farther. And if the apparent brightness is really bright, then we know it's because it's closer. This is this whole idea of a standard candle. And this is fairly new. In fact, just last year, the teams who figured this thing out, by the way, they were given the Nobel Prize in Physics. That was in uh, 2011. So what does this do for us? What in the world can we do with it? Well, the whole goal is to try to find this Hubble constant. So that's really, really important. So the Hubble constant, it's actually got weird units. I mean, you would think that it should just be in kilometers per second. I mean, we'll say it like this. So h0, you would think that it should be in just uh, kilometers per second. And then we could say also per megaparsec. I mean, that could be sort of, well, times one, I suppose. Right, because this is these things, so kilometers per second. Remember, if we take h0, h0 is a slope. And the reason why I knew this is because if we take a gradient or a slope of something, we do these units divided by these things, right? That's how we do a gradient, right? We would take any two random points. We would say is delta y over delta x. So in this case, we have these things in kilometers per second. We'd be dividing that value by something in megaparsecs. So our, our gradient would have the units of kilometers per second per megaparsec. And that's actually often the units that we use. Some people also just write it as a seconds to the minus one. And it turns out you can also do that because you can convert your kilometers and megaparsecs. You can have those sort of cancel each other out if you just have the right multiplication factor. Uh, because this is a unit of distance and so is this. 
but this is the most common sort of units that they use. So you could also say it's one over seconds. So you could say oh, it's seconds to the minus one. That could also be the units of H zero. But I'm gonna maybe just remove that one just to keep it simpler. So that's what we're doing. Now we're often trying to find H zero. And the problem is, I mean, knowing H zero is really important, but it's very difficult to tell what it is. Um, some of the data that I've seen, at least some people say that it's around 70. And again, it's 70 kilometers per second. And we could say, you know, per megaparsec. That's another way to write it. Same thing as this. Although I've also seen some people say that it's around 68. I've seen people say that it's 71. I've seen some people say that it's 73. Turns out all of these have very big implications to what the universe will do. So knowing what H0 is tells us a lot of things about the universe. So that's, that's one sort of branch of physics. It's where they're really trying to hone in, to sort of zero in on what H0 is.